Here we are for wonderful winter interest. And what better interest can we have than for some conifers? So we have the conifers of the Midwest and probably the top familiar uh, conifers that we have in the Midwest, pine, spruce, juniper, arborvitae, and yew. But there are others, and so we do have uh, some conifers that need a little bit of adjustment or maybe in the landscape and we can find those uh, also listed here fir larch hemlock and douglas fir and then we have our typical uh, cypress so we have uh, fall cypress bald cypress and dawn redwood so to start off we'll cover uh, fall cypress uh, fall cypress is a, a large evergreen that is native to Japan. It is in the cypress family. It grows best in the full sun. It does have a bark that has a red color. This vibrant foliage uh, is uh, very attractive in the landscape. Usually it's uh, used as a focal point or a specimen tree, uh, usually around an entryway but I have also seen it used as a large foundation shrub. It is hardy to zones uh, five to eight, and it does have uh, seed cones that have a globose shape. We have uh, the lemon thread uh, cultivar of the uh, Saguaro cypress, as it's also known by. So this is a fairly slow go growing uh, cultivar of fall cypress. And as far as growth goes, the, the conifers are categorized into uh, four different uh, categories for growth. We have miniature, which grows less than an inch per year, dwarf, which can grow an inch to six inches per year, intermediate, six to 12 inches per year, or the large that's going to have over a foot of growth per year. So these do take uh, quite a while for them to mature into a large shrub, but it's nice to have that uh, smaller size in the landscape. So the lemon thread, it does have a thread-like kind of foliage that has uh, weeping branches to an extent. It has, you know, a mixture of uh, the typical foliage that you would find in that filamentous or thread-like kind of foliage. Its annual growth is going to be four to five inches. This uh, golden threadleaf uh, so saguaro cypress, it's uh, pretty well known and found uh, in a lot of areas. I've seen it uh, used as a specimen plant. It also has that thread-like uh, foliage, and it can be a real showstopper here in the winter time. We also have the soft serve cultivar. Now these uh, typically don't require uh, pruning, and they do grow into uh, a nice either shrub or small tree. But here we can see how it's layered with uh, a couple of varieties of coleus. Uh, some purple fountain grass to the left, and some sedum. So nice contrast of colors uh, during the, the growing season, but that foliage can uh, stand out in the wintertime as well when those annuals uh, aren't present. The variegated Japanese red pine. This is a Pinus densiflora golden ghost. And you might note that it has uh, some netting here uh, surrounding it. A lot of these conifers you're going to want to protect from deer and other uh, problematic uh, attacks for mammals, especially during the winter when uh, the food sources become scarce. You might have some browsing, and we'll be covering that in our next webinar coming up. But this uh, evergreen uh, shrub or tree is uh, semi-dwarf. It does grow slowly, less than six inches per year. And the needles in the winter are light green, as we see, and but they have uh, bands of white alternating, so that variegation. 
So this uh, color contrast does hold up in, in the fall and into the winter. And here you find it uh, a little more close up photo of the foliage and you can see those distinctive banding of the, the yellow and green. So it grows uh, in a well-drained, slightly acidic soil, and it is uh, pretty drought resistant once it's established. Uh, the mother load uh, trailing juniper is uh, Juniperus horizontalis. And so that horizontal growth, it's not going to reach above four inches off the ground. It is a spreading shrub. And so it's typically used for a ground cover. This uh, ground cover does root whenever those branches spread. They creep and uh, root along the, the gra ground. So it is a, a nice, uh, vibrant color for the landscape in the summertime, but it turns a bronze color in the winter. So something to look forward to all season long. All right, the, the weeping blue spruce, uh, the blues, it is a narrow upright selection, uh, sometimes uh, needs to be staked so it can maintain its upright form. Usually has a strong uh, central leader. It does have that uh, pale blue, uh, kind of a powder blue foliage. It grows to about six feet tall by four feet wide. It has uh, the interesting weeping habit. Here it is uh, a little further up close. And this uh, does have a pendula kind of uh, foliage. And so pendula from the Latin translates to weeping or pendulous. And so here we have an up close uh, photo of weeping blue spruce. Uh, the weeping blue atlas cedar. This is a nice uh, addition to the landscape. It does have a kind of a curtain of foliage in this uh, weeping habit. But you want to be careful, uh, heavy snow can damage uh, the branches or break the branches. And you want to have adequate room uh, for this as it does uh, spread quite a bit with the, the branching. Now the way that these evergreens uh, are cultivated into the nursery trade, uh, usually they're found on uh, what's called a witch's broom or a sport. And so this is a genetic alteration of the, the original stock plant, if you will. And so sometimes they have a reversion where it will revert back to the original species. And we see this commonly with Alberta spruce, but they find a distinctive characteristic, uh, an abnormality in a, a plant. And they say, oh, we're gonna find out uh, what that does when we propagate it. So they'll take cuttings and they'll root those cuttings or graft them onto a, a rootstock. Whenever I was a student at uh, Southern Illinois University Carbondale, there was actually uh, bald cypress that was uh, found to have a witch's broom. And so that was uh, cultivated on to uh, grafted plants and all kinds of amazing features and plants, but sometimes we do have these uh, tree reversions where it can revert back to the original plant. So you want to try to, you know, remove that if possible, if you're trying to maintain your uh, original shrub, or if you're a plant propagator, uh, you know, can cultivate maybe a new species or a new variety. The Canadian hemlock, it's a, a nice smaller tree it does have a pyramidal uh, habit, these dark short green uh, needles. It does need a moist site uh, to grow, but it is very shade tolerant and you can find it under uh, possibly some other trees in your landscape. There are a couple of uh, problems, the woolly adglage ad aphid or uh, drought stress can threaten this. And so it does generally have few problems, but it does have this nice lacy evergreen foliage. And so here we see uh, kind of the overall habit of the Canadian hemlock. It's uh, 
should be watered uh, regularly, especially in uh, dry spells. And during the winter time, you can add a thick winter mulch to help conserve some of that moisture. Uh, an important note for your conifers, whenever the ground freezes, they're not, no longer able to take up water in that root zone. So you want to do an adequate job of watering uh, before we have the ground to freeze and make sure that those plants have adequate hydration. Alrighty, so this is Katie and I'm going to cover some different plants with interesting bark that we can add to our landscape um, so to add some winter interest. So a few of those, um, and one of my favorites is the red twig dogwood. So there's three different types of red twig dogwoods. There's the Tartarian dogwoods, which are native to Asia. And these are best known for being um, a variegated dogwood. So they have more of a variegated leaf. And it provides a lot of lovely benefits um, that we can add. They do like to be um, in afternoon shade or especially in hot climates. And it's not something that you would want to plant too far south. Um, so more of our southern states. We also have the red osier dogwood, um, which is one that is native to North America and one that's more commonly seen around this area. While this species is not always reliable in hot, humid areas, there are some um, within this family that do well in more of the hot, humid areas. So that's something to consider if planting a red osier dogwood. And then we have the blood twig dogwoods. And this one tends to grow more rapidly. Without pruning, it can become leggy and scruffy. Um, Midwinter fire is one that is popular in the blood, blood twig dogwood. Uh, so if that's something that you're interested in as well, that's an option. There are a lot of similarities between these three species, and it can be difficult to distinguish between the three. Um, so if there's something that you specifically want, it's good to do your research and figure out uh, which one is going to work best for you and find a reputable nursery to purchase this from. So in addition to the red twig dogwoods, we also have the yellow twig dogwood, um, which is a, a, a name cultivar of the red twig dogwood. So they look very similar, obviously, but the yellow twig dogwood has yellow yellow or greenish stems. Uh, both of these plants, the red and yellow twig dogwoods, can get anywhere from six to nine feet tall, so they can get to a decent size. In this picture, you can really see how nice the red and yellow twig dogwood look. Uh, so it's going to look like this during the winter months. So it is a deciduous flowering shrub, and it does have leaves on it during the spring and summer months. And then um, I'll show you in a bit. It does get a nice fall color to it, and then it drops its leaves, and we have the yellow and red twigs to enjoy during the winter months. They are part of the dogwood family, as you can probably guess from the name, and they do prefer full sun to part shade. So if you have an area where that fits and you would like to plant one of these, they're a great option. They do do well in a more acidic soil, so anywhere from a 5.5 to a 6.6 .6 pH. They bloom in spring and they do have a pretty flower. So um, they do provide interest throughout the growing season. And they're suggested for our, our USDA growing zones three through eight. So it fits well for where we're located in Illinois. So as I had mentioned, they do brighten your winter landscape with their bright red or yellow branches but the shrubs can also provide four season interest with beautiful spring blossoms that you can see here. And then in the summer, depending on which um, dogwood that you have, you can have variegated leaves that you see here, or you can just have the dark green leaves. And then we also get berry development, which adds to the beauty of these plants. And then as I had mentioned previously, they also have a nice fall color. So they really provide uh, an attractive um, presence in our landscape throughout all of the different seasons. As for maintenance, they really don't require a lot of maintenance. 
if you do decide to fertilize them, you can do so in early spring. And that's just a simple top dressing, preferably with something like compost. Um, another thing to do is you can trim the roots away to, to control spread. So as you can see with this red twig dogwood in the background, there's some areas where it's more woody and it doesn't have the red color. So we often see more of a red color in new growth. And so as growth becomes older, it's going to get that brown color to it. Um, so by trimming that back, it's, it's, you can maintain that red color. So it is suggested that the, um, that you should trim about 25% of the old stems away each spring, which will help to stimulate new stems and good color. Or you can even cut the entire stem down to about eight inches above the ground. So if you think that your red twig or yellow twig dogwood is getting too large, you can cut it back quite considerably and you'll have decent growth in the next year. It's suggested that you can do this about every three years or so to give it some rejuvenation. Or if you're just noticing that you're losing color over the years, you can do it for that as well. So like I said, since the younger branches bear the brightest color, that is why we, um, it's encouraged that you cut, that, cut those twigs back. And then obviously if the bush is overgrown, you can cut it back to the ground and it will return within a, a year with uh, red stems. Some common issues that we do see with red and yellow twig dogwood is we can see issues such as scale, leaf miners, bagworms. These aren't really something that we're too concerned with because it is rarely an issue. Some other things include leaf and twig blight, canker, or leaf spots, which with this, it can be maintained just by trimming back those diseased branches. And that's something that we should be doing anyway. So it's something that we wouldn't expect to see very commonly. And then as I mentioned, we do see berries um, with these dogwoods. And so they do provide a nice wildlife attraction to a lot of songbirds. And so if you like birds, then it's another great option for adding to your landscape as it can be provide nesting area and um, a safe spot for birds as well as a food source with the berries. Next up we have the paper bark maple. So this one is a small deciduous oval to oval rounded tree with slender upright branching. It is particularly noted for its exfoliating copper orange to cinnamon reddish brown bark and its showy red to orange ball color. It only grows to be about 20 to 30 feet tall. So it does grow pretty slow for maples and it can take up to 20 years to reach the full height. It is a native um, to mixed forest in central China. So it's not one that is native to the US, um, but it is an attractive one. So it's a nice option for your landscape as well. Paper bark maples do produce a greenish flower in the spring, but it's not something that is necessarily all that attractive. So um, when we place this in our landscape, we want to look for an area that provides full, full sun to part shade, and they do tolerate clay soil. Um, so that's something to consider as well. So the bark on the trunk and limbs is what is most attractive about this. So uh, back to that interesting bark. And it's most interesting because it does peel into large curls, which remain on the tree rather than falling to the ground. And it also provides a nice attractive contrast. So uh, the inner bark is tan to rose brown. And the the papery feeling bark that gives the tree its name doesn't appear until the tree is about six or seven years old. So once it starts, the bark continues to peel for the rest of, the, of its life. The paper bark maple is the only maple species with this type of peeling bark. And then if you look at the leaves, you'll notice that it has trifoliate leaves. So it has three leaves here and they do have two leaflets with the middle leaflet being short stocked. As you can see, they do have a nice green color through the growing season, 
but in the fall they get that red orange color which is again an attractive sight. So as for care and maintenance there's not a lot of care and maintenance required with a paper bark maple. Um, something to consider is pruning so if you want it to be um, a single trunk or multiple stems, that's something that should be determined early on so you can get it started in the growth habit that you'd like it to be. Either way, it's attractive. So here you can see that it has multiple stems, or if you wanted to, you can prune it so that it has one central leader. Beyond this, there's not a lot of other work to do. You want to make sure that you're removing dead disease or damaged wood. And there's really not many insect or disease problems with paper bark maple. As for some other plants or trees that have some interesting bark, I've included here uh, white satin birch or river birch. So both of these have um, some very standout uh, bark or interesting bark. And so that's something also that we can add to our landscape to, to provide um, something to, to look at or to add to our landscape for the winter period. But up next, we have Ken Johnson, and he's going to talk about holly and winterberry. All right. Thank you, Katie. Uh, so like Katie mentioned, we're going to do holly and winterberry next. So these are primarily grown because of their red berries, and also <clears throat> many of them are evergreen, so they have that nice green uh, foliage, so that red and green contrast. Uh, can look quite nice uh, with kind of a snowy background a lot of times in the winter when we do get snow. Uh, and hollies have have kind of been grown and have been important to humans for kind of a long period of time. Um, holly was considered sacred by ancient Romans. Um, it was used uh, to honor God Saturn uh, during the Saturnalia festival uh, during the winter solstice. So they would carry around holly, give that to people as gifts, and then Early Christians would also do this to avoid persecution, and then it kind of morphed into um, being a, a symbol of, of Christmas time as well. All right, so holly and winterberry, uh, they are going to be in the same genus, the genus Ilix. This is in the family Aquifoliaceae, and that's primarily going to be um, holly plants and, and other relatives. Um, they can range from small shrubs to large trees getting 50, 60, 70 feet tall, sometimes depending on the species, um, and they are distributed um, worldwide, uh, with most species um, being in um, in the in the Americas and Southeast Asia, but there are temperate as well as tropical species. Um, around 800 of the other species are going to be evergreen, so what we typically think of as hollies, but there are about 30 or so species uh, that are deciduous, uh, like this picture here. This is winterberry. Uh, that is an example of a deciduous uh, holly type plant. As a general rule of thumb, hollies are going to like moist. Um, organics, they're going to have a decent amount of organic matter in the soils, uh, but that soil is also going to be well drained. Uh, many of the hollies do not like wet soils, so uh, keep that in mind. Um, there are some that we'll talk about that, that will tolerate wetter soils, though, and they are typically going to require an acidic pH. So depending on where you're at in the state, um, you may have to adjust the soil a little bit uh, if you're going to try to grow hollies. They can be grown full sun to part shade. Uh, Typically, you get better fruiting, you get more flowers, better fruiting, um, the more sun they have. So keep that in mind. I have, I have some winter berries and, and some of them get more sun than others. And you can definitely tell which ones have more sun um, come winter uh, when you look at the, the amount of berries on the, their individual plants. Um, so hollies and winter berries, for the most part, almost all of them are going to be dioecious. So you have separate male and female plants, which is going to be important when you are purchasing and, and planting plants you need to make sure you have the male plants if you want to end up with berries because uh, you need those that pollen to fertilize uh, the female flowers. So this picture here is just an example of what those flowers look like. Uh, so on the top of those are the male flowers. Uh, you can see those four stamens on there and then the bottom uh, is the female plant. You can see that large green uh, ovary there that's going to be where the fruit is going to, to develop. Depending on the species, it can vary, but typically you need one male plant for every three to 10 female plants. Um, some will need more, some will need a bigger ratio, it just kind of depends on the species. And the closer you can have those male and female plants together, the better. Uh, as pollinators are gonna have to transfer that pollen from, from the male plant to the female plant. So the shorter distance they have to go, the, the better pollination you're going to get. Typically you don't want them within a couple hundred feet 
um, what would kind of be the max you'd want them apart. Most of most hollies and winter berries are going to have red berries, uh, but there can be uh, yellow, um, orange, and there are some that are almost black. Um, and while we typically refer to them as berries, technically uh, they are droops because they have uh, kind of a, a woody layer, kind of a woody coating around that's a harder coating around that seed, whereas berries do not. So if you want to get technical about it, they're considered droops. The, these berries, I'll just refer to them as berries. Uh, they can last for three to six months. A lot of that depends on wildlife activity. Um, like the dogwoods Katie was mentioning, a lot of birds will feed on these berries. Uh, they tend to prefer the red ones. So if you have a yellow berried variety, those tend to stick around a lot longer. Uh, birds will prefer the red ones. And once all the red berries are gone, then they'll move into the, the yellow and the orange ones um, as well. Um, and here are just some examples of those berries. Uh, so those um, yellow berries on top there, um, an example of this would be, there's an American holly uh, cultivar called yellow jacket. I don't know if that's this particular picture, but it has yellow berries. Uh, again, in the middle there is the winter berry. And then on the bottom um, is gall berry or ink berry, which is a native species that has almost black berries on it. So just some species that are out there. Again, there are hundreds of species and we're only gonna cover um, a couple of them there, and a lot of them will hybridize with one another, so there are a lot of hybrids out there as well. So if you're thinking of holly or, or winterberry, do your do a little bit of research um, and kind of match of what match what you're looking for with, with the plants available out there. Um, English holly, this is kind of the holly we typically think of at, at Christmas time um, with decorations and stuff, uh, with those spiny leaves and bright red berries on them. Um, they are not a very good plant for Illinois unless you're living in so, kind of far Southern Illinois, they're probably not going to be winter hardy for most of the state. They're just typically zones seven through nine. They also do not like hot, humid weather, which would kind of eliminate Southern Illinois. So these are, these grow best kind of obviously in England, um, the UK, as well as Pacific Northwest, um, they have naturalized there. Uh, but if you were going to try to grow them in Illinois, you want to provide some protection from winter wind. Again, they're not particularly cold hardy for the state. Um, afternoon shade is also good, uh, particularly in, in areas where we have hot, humid weather like we do in Illinois. So providing those two, you may, if you have that, that right microclimate, you may be able to, but um, probably not, probably one you want to steer clear of. Um, they do have, um, again, those spiny uh, evergreen leaves on there. They're py pyramidal trees. They have a nice pyramid form, kind of like Christmas, we typically think of as a Christmas tree shape. Um, they get 30, 50 feet tall, up to 80 feet tall um, in some cases. Obviously, probably not getting that large in Illinois because we just don't have the right climate for them. And you can see in that, that top picture there, there are some variegated uh, cultivars out there as well. Next up, we've got American holly, and this one is native to um, the United States. Um, not really widespread in Illinois, but it is native to some parts of Illinois. Uh, it does not tolerate wet soil, so if, if you are growing this, you need to make sure you have a well-drained site. Again, afternoon shade is good, um, just kind of a little bit of relief from the heat and stuff. Uh, again, as a pyramidal tree, so you can see that on the picture on the right there, a little bit smaller than English holly, uh, typically 15 to 30 feet tall, but they can reach uh, 50 plus feet tall um, in the wild. This is the only native holly species, um, at least in the United States, um, that has the spiny green leaves and bright red berries. And again, this is an evergreen species as well. So it kind of looks similar to that English holly. Uh, as far as pollination goes, typical recommendation is one male plant for every three female plants to get um, good pollination and get good uh, fruit set on those plants. Uh, and it is hardy from zones five through nine. So that's going to cover um, the entirety uh, of the state. And there are a number of different cultivars out there, uh, something like uh, Kroonberg is more of an upright, more of a columnar uh, type plant. You know, the cultivar Howard has got fewer spines on the on the leaves and stuff. So there, there is some variety out there. There are some that are smaller plants um, as well. Uh, next, we've got winterberry. So this one um, can tolerate some, some wetter soil, some poorly drained soils. Um, its native habitat is more swampy areas. So if you have a wetter, wetter soils, this may be a good option um, if you want something some kind of holly. Um, it is an upright rounded habit shrub. Uh, you can see that in the picture on the left there. Typically three to 12 feet tall um, in the wild and they may sucker especially in the wild and kind of your 
your non-cultivated variety types, um, and they can form thickets. So keep that in mind. Uh, typically, you're, you're, the cultivars you're purchasing from nurseries and stuff don't really uh, sucker all that much, though. Uh, they will produce, uh, typically going to produce red berries, and the common recommendation is one male plant for every five to ten females. Uh, and they are deciduous, so they will drop their leaves um, in the winter. Fall color really isn't um, all that spectacular. Sometimes it can be a little bit of a maroon color, but that's, that's not why you would want to grow them for their fall color. You're growing them for those red berries. Um, in the winter. And this is zone three through nine. So again, um, you can grow, be grown throughout the state. Uh, this picture on the right there, that is um, uh, Barry Poppins. That's the cultivar I have growing in my house. Um, and there is an associated male called Mr. Poppins that goes along with it. So a lot of these cultivars have a male and female um, that go well with each other and they're, and they're named similarly. Uh, and this Barry Poppins only gets to be about uh, three to four feet tall. So not quite as large as the straight species. Now we also have possum haw, which is another uh, native plant to the United States. Uh, so again, this one can tolerate heavy soils and wetter conditions. So again, this would probably maybe a good option for a lot of places in, in Illinois where we have heavier soils. Um, upright shrub with a spreading round crown. So you can see on the picture on the right there, how that, that crown kind of fans out up at the top. Um, you can get seven to 15 feet tall, but again, there are cultivars um, of this plant that, that do stay shorter. Uh, typically gonna have orange, orangish red or red berries on them uh, and, and commonly recommended one, one male per one to two female plants to get good uh, pollination and good fruit set on those. Um, and this is another deciduous species, so it will drop its leaves and good through zones five through nine. Um, and the last one I will mention is going to be inkberry. Uh, so again, this is another native uh, species here in the United States. They will tolerate wet and heavier soils. So again, uh, good for a lot of us here in Illinois. Uh, upright shrub with a more rounded habit. So you can see that on the picture of the left there. Uh, they are stoloniferous. So uh, again, more the the wild type plants. Uh, they will spread by stolons. And again, they can create large um, colonies, um, thickets of them. So again, keep that in mind. Your, your more cultivated varieties don't do this um, as much though and typically get five to eight feet tall. And again, there are some that are smaller. Uh, these are evergreen and they do have these black berries, which is, which is something different uh, when, you, when you think about hollies uh, Again, zones four through nine. So it's gonna be good throughout the state. And some of these, a lot of the cultivars out there are kind of marketed as boxwood alternatives. Uh, so there's stuff like gem box, um, shamrock, uh, strong box. These are all get about three, three to five feet tall, somewhere in that range. Um, and, and can be used as a, a boxwood alternative. Uh, some of the problems we can encounter with hollies is chlorosis. So if you're growing uh, holly in higher pH soils, uh, the, the, those leaves may start to turn yellow. So if you're seeing yellowing leaves on your plants, you may wanna check your soil pH, uh, check the soil drainage, it may be too wet and causing some root rot issues, which is could lead to some chlorosis on the plant as well. Uh, there's holly leaf miner, that's the picture on the right there. Um, so there is a fly, um, that maggot will feed on the, the inner tissues of that leaf, um, tunnel through there. Um, so that can cause issues. Typically good sanitation, remove those leaves, clean those up. Um, so they can't pupate into the soil and stuff. And if it gets bad enough, you can spray those leaves when they're young, when they're starting to emerge, when those flies are laying their eggs. Uh, spider mites, white fly scale can also be an issue. And again, that's an occasional issue. So just monitor for those and um, spray if needed. Uh, leaf spot and tar spots, you can have some leaf spots on there. Again, good sanitation um, can oftentimes do a good job of cleaning this up um, and then pruning and getting good airflow through there so those leaves dry out um, can help prevent issues with those particular diseases. Uh, one common kind of question or issue people may have with um, hollies and stuff is not getting any fruit production. So there's a number of different reasons this can happen. Um, one is, do you have any male plants present if you only have one holly plant and there's no, if you only have one female holly plant and there's no male plants around, you're probably not going to get uh, fruit production on there. Um, are they compatible? Are the male and female plants blooming at the same time? Will they pollinate each other? Um, so check that out. If you're purchasing plants, a lot of times they will recommend uh, male cultivars to go with those females. Or you could have had a uh, mislabeled plant that you had a plant that was labeled as a female, but it's actually a male. 
So check out the flowers on those plants to see if you have a male or female uh, plant there. Immature plants, if you're buying these from a nursery, it probably isn't going to be an issue, but typically plants grown from seed can take three to five years to begin flowering. If they're taken from cuttings, it can be a couple of years. Um, so a possibility, but again, you know, typically when you're buying these in the nursery, they are of blooming age most of the time. Uh, you could have poor growing conditions. Um, so again, moist, well-drained soil. So soils could be too dry. Um, they just you know, hold on to the water too much. Um, they may, or, or they, yeah, it could be too wet, it could be too dry. The so a soil may not be acidic enough, which could cause issues with flowering. A um, bunch of different things that could potentially cause that. Um, pruning, do too much uh, pruning too heavy uh, can cause issues as well. Typically, um, early summer is going to be the best time to prune our evergreen hollies. Um, they're setting their, their flowers in the fall. So if we prune too late, we're pruning off flower buds. Um, potentially. Um, and then, you know, if we do, again, if we do it too late, new growth, that's not going to harden off um, and potentially be killed um, as well. Um, and deciduous holly is typically going to be pruning, uh, blooming on new wood. So pruning in late winter um, would be a good option for that, but you don't want to prune more than one third of the shrub um, at a time. Um, and then we do have some environmental problems. Um, so if we have drought, or um, too much water, you know, that could affect the flowering ability. We get a late frost come in and kill all those flowers off again. We're not going to have any berry production um, as well. So a variety of different factors that can cause us. So you may need to go out and, and look at the weather history, site conditions, um, things like that to, to try to figure out what's going on and, and why you're not getting any berries um, on your plants. And with that, we'll turn it over to Chris. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Chris Enroth, and uh, I am based in Macomb, Illinois, and excited to talk to you today about uh, the, the final topic for our session, plant growth habit. Uh, pictured here is actually a blue atlas cedar. Uh, I think Andrew, in, in the beginning, he showed a picture of a weeping blue atlas cedar, and he even mentioned uh, the, the reversion back to its uh, natural state. Well, uh, this here is a weeping blue atlas cedar that never wept. It was just a happy plant, I suppose. <laughs> it never had any reason to weep. Um, so was it a reversion or was it some kind of error in the nursery? Uh, we don't know, but uh, at this point in its life, it is established and it's about as upright as an upright plant can get. Uh, so I just wanted to remark on that right there. And a lot of folks might be curious, well, what is plant growth? habit. Uh, the pictured here is an illustration of though the various habits uh, that we can get with our plants. And uh, so when we say habit, it's really a horticulturist term for the form or the shape. And uh, as you can see here, some very common ones are columnar, oval, vase, weeping, pyramidal, or pyramidal, if you're like me, and that's how I prefer to say it, and rounded. There's other types of shapes. Uh, one that comes to mind is irregular. Uh, sometimes trees and their maturity grow to an irregular form or habit. And sometimes trees transition from one habit to another from their uh, life cycle. I, for instance, oaks, they tend to have a very pyramidal growth habit in their juvenile form. And yet as they grow and mature, you might see them become more rounded to oval shaped. Now, there is a lot that we can do with plant growth habit when it comes to designing our yards. Actually, when I was a student studying landscape architecture at Kansas State, they had, had us do this design exercise where we could only focus on the habit or the form of the plants. And so we had this, had to mock up or model um, a landscape design only using black and white materials, primarily like styrofoam balls, cones, uh, cylinders, uh, even, you know, uh, like Q-tips and cotton balls, things like that, to, to only focus purely on the habit of these plants and trying to create designs just just looking just purely at that, that form or shape of those plants. It was quite an exercise and it really gets you thinking about how we can just use a sh the shape of a plant to create a, a really interesting, aesthetically pleasing design. 
Now, the other thing that happens with habit is what we are trying to accomplish them uh, in terms of how they can fit in our yards. Now, when we look at the development trends for uh, Americans in residential area, our, our residential development patterns, we are noticing that our houses are getting bigger and our lot sizes are getting smaller. Plant breeders understand this, and so they are developing more and more plants to have a dwarf growth habit. Uh, so uh, pictured here, I believe this is uh, blue star juniper. Um, unconfirmed if that's what it really is, but that's what I believe it is right here. Uh, this is a tiny plant and it grows, oh, you know, maybe uh, I think this has been in the ground for about five to six years now. Uh, and it might have grown a couple extra inches beyond this. So very slow growing, a smaller plant. It tops out about two foot tall, maybe two foot in spread uh, over a long period of time. So very, very small, uh, just so kind of this dwarf, kind of ball shaped rounded growth habit. Now contrast that to another uh, a juniper. Now I think blue star juniper is Juniperus squamata. Pictured here, if we ignore the tree in the foreground, the trees in the background, that is actually Taylor juniper. Now this is a selection from Juniperus virginiana, which is our native uh, 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 Eastern red cedar. Now this is, uh, Taylor is an introduction from uh, the University of Nebraska Arboretum, and it is selected for its fastigiate habit. Now for, I would say my entire career, uh, maybe just a year ago, I pronounced that word incorrectly. Um, for some reason, my brain ignored the second I in fastigiate, and I pronounced it fastigate. I don't know. But now that we know how to say it, fastigiate means column columnar or narrow or upright. And so you might see a lot of other plant selections with a columnar habit with the cultivar name fastigiate. So if you're ever looking through the catalog and you're like, what does fastigiate mean? That's what it means. So Taylor juniper is selected. This plant is only going to get maybe three foot wide, but it's going to grow up to 20, 25 foot tall. Now that I, I, I've been obsessed with these Taylor junipers. I actually was fortunate enough to be able to plant these. This is at the Ottoman Garden at Missouri Botanical Garden. Uh, this is pictured right after planting. Um, I, I tried to request the uh, a more recent picture from Botanical Garden, but I did not get a response uh, from uh, Mobot before this presentation. So you're just going to have to go check them out uh, there. But they mimic the Italian cypresses. That's kind of they're mimicking that habit, that upright habit that uh, you might see when you go to Italy and you see the cypresses flanking either side of a, like a, a garden or the entrance into a manor or, or a chateau, whatever. And so. These are just absolutely fast, uh, fantastic trees. I've planted a few at my other house um, that we've sold and since moved on, but they established well. Not only are they have a fantastic growth habit, they were an amazing habitat for a lot of birds in the winter time. So, you know, that we're not talking about that necessarily today, um, but also kind of one of those things to consider is habitat when it comes to our wildlife friends in the winter. Another plant I want to call your mind to when it comes to that habit is service berry. Now, there's many, many different types of service berries uh, in the genus Amalac here. Um, you know, so, so we can't necessarily have time to go into all of them. That is a class in and of itself. But really, the, the thing that really stands out when it comes to winter interest with our service berry is that smooth gray bark and that vase-shaped habit. Um, so this is what's pictured here. Uh, this is a new planting uh, with the uh, service berry. Now, I would love to see the boxwoods in the background to be much bigger to provide a more colorful backdrop for that service berry. That's when I think those stems really do pop and you can really see that vase shape. So after a few years, once those boxwoods behind that this tree mature, uh, the tree in the foreground will really start to pop and really uh, come into its own here from a design standpoint. That's kind of one of the drawbacks when it comes to landscape design is that you have to wait most of the time unless you have the money to pay for bigger plants, which I know we all don't. Um, now, service berry it, in general is a woodland plant. Um, typically, you would see this growing maybe in the understory or as an edge species. So you could probably get away with some partial shade to full sun. 
Um, now I will add, service berry is in the rosaceae family. And if you've ever tried to grow a rose before or an apple, uh, you know, uh, those both being in the rose family, there's lots of pests and things to consider. Now this particular plant over time, I have noted a considerable amount of foliar leaf pathogens that occur on it, especially later on in the season. Um, there's probably better selections these days, uh, but I have definitely been seeing things like apple scab uh, and things popping up on this particular plant. And usually by late August, it's almost completely defoliated. Um, but it keeps coming back every year. Uh, it does yield a, a tasty, delicious fruit uh, in June, because another common name for this is Juneberry. Um, I, you, so you can plant this here as a specimen. I have also seen serviceberry planted as a kind of a hedge. Now with that vase shaped habit and there's more growth up top, you can kind of see underneath and it creates another design term that we would like to use. It's called a baffle. So it sort of obscures your view, but you can also see through that and makes it develops interest in maybe going around the hedge and seeing what's on the other side. And so you can work it in two different types of ways, either as a specimen planting or maybe even as a mass planting of these. And for us uh, here in Illinois, for the most part, um, the various species of service berry, you know, we're looking at a hardiness either to three to four, so we are good to go, at least here in Illinois. Another one I want to talk about is witch hazel, and the kind of the reason for this is the same reason as a service berry, is because it has that vase-shaped habit. Um, there's actually a lot of interesting uh, talk about this online. People are saying this is like basically like an upside down triangle that is like a perfect triangle, isosceles, um, uh, you know, in, a, in its younger form. As witch hazel tends to age, I've noticed a few of them get more of a, like a gnarled look. It almost looks uh, a bit more like a spooky Halloween type plant. Um, now, witch hazel is in the Hamamelis genus, and there are a couple different species out there. Um, pictured here, I am guessing this is more than likely the Chinese witch hazel. Chinese witch hazel is a bit more floriferous or more has more flowers uh, than our native common witch hazel, which is uh, Hymomelis virginiana. Um, so Chinese witch hazel or a hybrid of Chinese and Japanese, which is uh, uh, Hamamelis X intermedia. Those are common ones that we'd probably find in the nursery. We would still be able to find our uh, common witch hazel, again, Hamamelis virginiana, in the nursery setting. Um, but if, you're, if the flower show is what you're looking for, the Chinese witch hazel is probably the way to go. Uh, they're really clusters of flowers and you have four petals emerging from each flower. It's kind of a neat thing to look at. Um, now, when you know, I, I look at days like today, um, it is 71 degrees, December 15th. Uh, witch hazel, depending on the species, will flower at various times throughout the winter. Um, so common witch hazel uh, will flower, which is our native one, will flower probably more in the October, November timeframe. Uh, common witch hazel, if you're wondering in terms of where is it native, most of Illinois, when we look at its natural range, we don't see it growing here. However, there are pockets up in northeastern Illinois where we would have found it before European settlement. And, but it grows just fine throughout the entire state. Um, so we also do have another Native American witch hazel, the vernal witch hazel. And we would find this naturally growing more in like the gravel beds and Missouri and Arkansas. Um, so it's pretty tolerant of a lot of different soil conditions, and it's more of a shrub type habit, uh, still a bit more upright than, a, a, you know, like a mounded shrub. So a bit more upright uh, habit shrub, uh, and that would flower probably in January. Chinese, Japanese witch hazels, they would flower, again, depends a bit where you're at in the state, because we are, Illinois is a long state. Um, it would flower more in February, southern Illinois, probably might start seeing flowers in the late January time frame. Again, just like service berry, uh, these are predominantly understory plants, so you could put these uh, in underneath shade trees. Um, uh, light shade, partial sun, uh, this is where I tend to see them growing um, in my neck of the woods, uh, but just absolutely beautiful plant and uh, creates a, a beautiful winter habit, uh, especially with that added bonus of having winter blooms. Now, uh, 
I didn't get a good picture of this one, uh, but at our last Farm Progress show uh, this past summer, we had a pollinator plot and we included the shrub-like vernal witch hazel, again, the one native to the gravel beds, Missouri and Arkansas. Um, and always, you know, kind of in the back of my mind, I'm thinking about pollinator resources. And so because this starts to uh, bloom in the January timeframe, what a fantastic uh, pollen source for pollinators. And yes, there are insects that are active during those warm days, uh, like today, again, it's 71 degrees, a bit of an outlier when it comes to weather. But um, on days like today, there are active insects and they're looking for resources for them. And so consider planting a witch hazel in your yard. Another one that I, I, I came across in my research here is Harry Lauder's walking stick. Um, so that's what's pictured here. I mean, that's awesome. What a beautiful habit. This irregular, contorted, um, just, just totally, it looks like it came straight from a Halloween novel or something. Um, now, if you were in last week's session where I talked about hazelnut, you will know this is Coriolis avalana. Aval uh, this is European hazelnut. In North America, there is a native fungus called Eastern filbert blight that attacks this species. And so I've seen a lot of uh, contorted filbert, or it really is just is European hazelnut planted here in Illinois, only to be met by this. This, this is the Eastern filbert blight. Those are the uh, kind of those pustule canker uh, that, that, that form on the branches there. So there are alternatives to this. I once grew a corkscrew willow and I will say corkscrew willows it's kind of like a, uh, a hot burning fire. They grow fast and that's really cool, but they tend to, to whenever they encounter stress to just uh, explode, implode in on themselves and die. Um, and, and, and perhaps it's because what I encountered was the drought of 2012. Um, there was no amount of water that we could apply to our corkscrew willow to, to keep it from drying out uh, and, it, and it died from that. We also do have contorted beach, uh, tortusa, uh, and then also, this is maybe one of my favorite cultivar names. We have the European larch, the cultivar named Varied Directions. Uh, again, one of those contorted uh, type plants out there. So th there are some alternatives to us. Um, now I want to spend just a second, and this is a, a broad categorization here of weeping stuff. Um, I, I will say when it comes to the weeping habit, in my uh, opinion, it works best as a specimen or a focal point in the landscape. It's kind of like variegated foliage. You can overdo it. Um, and so that, that, that's kind of where I'm coming from, from that, that weeping perspective. It looks great as a singular plant. If your entire landscape is all weeping, I don't know, I might walk in the backyard and start crying with the plants. Um, the picture here is weeping larch. Uh, this is Larix decidua pendula. Um, I have seen this one growing in central Illinois, and the person actually trained it to weep over the entrance into their garden. So over like a pergola or kind of arbor area. Absolutely beautiful. I took a picture uh, on my tablet and my three-year-old not long after that broke my tablet. So We'll just have to suffer through not knowing what that looks like. Um, but absolutely beautiful uh, plants, some really neat things that you can do with plants with the weeping habit. Now, you can't talk about weeping plants without mentioning weeping willow, a very common plant uh, out there, you know, uh, might even uh, be as bold as to say overused in terms of its weeping habit and trying to in incorporate that into a landscape. But, but, but definitely a, a mainstay in terms of this specific habit of plants. Pictured here is weeping European beech uh, pendula. Uh, now this is taken in Europe, of course, as you can see by the photo, um, but just what a stunning display of, of habit there uh, over the water. Um, so absolutely beautiful. Um, so that's pendula. As you can see, it's a large tree. Uh, another one that you, that might be of interest to folks is purple fountain. It's a purple leaf type uh, that weeps as well. Uh, weeping cherries, I, we've all seen those. There's a lot of them. Snow fountains is one of them. 
Um, uh, I think Rose, Rose of Cascade is another one. So there's a lot of different weeping cherries. Um, Redbud has had what I call a renaissance in the plant breeding world. Um, there's all different types of things happening with Redbud, including weeping types. Uh, pictured here is Lavender Twist Redbud. Absolutely beautiful. Um, and then also uh, river birch. Um, now I think river birch even by itself, we saw a picture even uh, with, with Katie's slide set of a mature birch. Those almost have a natural weeping habit when they mature, but they have even bred a weeping habit uh, river birch. So summer cascade is, is one of them. So uh, you get the benefit of the interesting bark, uh, exfoliating bark, and then the weeping habit there. So, and I just feel like last winter, there were so many opportunities where uh, we had kind of mild night times and then it froze in the morning. So we had kind of this uh, kind of foggy evenings. And then in the mornings, we'd wake up to this. There's nothing that captures that better than a weeping plant. The only thing to make this image better is if we had the sun shining behind this tree and we'd see just uh, uh, all prism prisms of color here. Now, I just wanna show you, when it comes to plant habit, probably one of the best places to see this, uh, this design technique in action is at a Japanese garden. Japanese garden design focuses on the color green. And so we can see here, they create design expressions through the various habits, forms and shapes of plants. And so you, as you can start to see, you can pick up the mounding and the upright and the spreading and the oval type habits. Um, you know, looking here, we can see how they use these to symbolize a lot of different things as part as Japanese garden design goes. Uh, but even further, the weeping habit of that willow here in the background, it draws our eyes down to the water. And so there is function behind all of this. And there's always reason behind what habit we choose with plants. Um, we can use them to form our, or flank a view inward um, or outward. Uh, so to speak. Now, my backyard is, is not as large as this one here at the Morton Arboretum, um, but we can utilize these plants and their various habits to create entrance, or to create interest, to shape our entrances and to shape the spaces in which we reside in our landscape. So um, hopefully, uh, you, giving you a little bit of inspiration about how we can utilize plant habit uh, for uh, designing our landscapes. Um, if you would like to know more uh, about uh, many of these topics, uh, we do have the Good Growing blog, which you can go to here, uh, go.illinois.edu slash goodgrowing. We also have a weekly podcast. Um, we talked to a plant pathologist last week, and that was a fascinating dive into what happens under the microscope there uh, and what afflicts our plants, things that we can't see. Uh, so you can check out our podcast, go.illinois.edu slash goodgrowing podcast. Now, it seems like our chat box has uh, been active here. I'll finally plug our this QR code here or this short URL uh, for an evaluation. Tell us how we did. Tell us what you enjoyed. What would you like to hear more about? 